So, the announcements as usual. First and foremost, most important announcement every week. What is it? No. Uh, I appreciate your enthusiasm to keep the doors open. I really do. But no, the most important announcement every week is we're all in recovery and we need our meetings. Right? Amen. And that means that we need to get to more than one meeting a week. Church is good. You need church. Right? That's why we're here. God has things to say to us. It's incredible. But we also need that time where we work on us. And so getting to a meeting is critical. So reminder of the meetings that I like to attend, and then we'll talk about the other meetings that are available as well. All right. Number one, celebrate recovery. Monday night, Old Town Christian Outreach in Saginaw, 7 o'clock in the evening. By the way, this week I will be sharing my testimony. So feel free to come out and participate in that. Tuesday night. Celebrate Recovery at Bay City First over on Young's Ditch at 6.30. Right? Great meeting. Wednesday night, Mission Recovery. Right here, right up there, 7 o'clock every Wednesday night, except for last week because Dad was at the hospital and I had to be there with him and I couldn't get here to unlock the doors, so I apologize for that. Woohoo! Right. <laughs> <laughs> But every Wednesday night, Mission Recovery, it's an opportunity to engage Jesus Christ as your higher power and engage your recovery. Friday night, we do a fellowship night here every Friday night, starting at, I'm sorry, Bill, every Wednesday night also at 6 o'clock if you get here early, you can hang out. Bill brings soup, and it's really good, so you're still doing that, right? Okay, good, because I missed last week. I wanted my soup, and I didn't get to be here. So. <laughs> um, and so that's Wednesday night. Friday night, we do a fellowship time. starts at 6 o'clock. At 7 o'clock, we start a movie on the screen here. We hang out. We watch the movie together. Afterwards, we may talk about it, but we always have a good time, and it's a safe place to be on a Friday night. Woo-hoo! Right, exactly. Now... That being said, there are a lot of other recovery meetings you can get to. The cabin has several every day, right? There's several of you in here that attend those meetings. Um, Pier 360 has their online Zoom meetings, and I think Thursday <laughs> afternoon they do an in-person meeting over at their office at 4 o'clock. Um, and there are many, many other meetings. NA, AA, Al-Anon, there, I mean... So do not miss your meetings. You are not doing life alone. If you are, you're doing something wrong. Did I get your attention? Yeah. Okay. Uh, It's important that we remember we can't do life alone. We have to be together with others that understand the process. And it's critical that we do that. Uh, Another announcement. The music that we play every week, more often than not, um, is often comes from requests. So if you have something you would like to hear on a Sunday afternoon, uh, please message my wife Rhonda. Um, you can either message through the church Facebook page or you can message her directly. Uh, and she will, as the Spirit leads, work those songs into our, our Sunday services. Um, and we allow pretty much anything. Yes, even rap, Joe. <laughs> I was going to say, call a big eight line. <laughs> but it, as long as it's a Christ centered song, you know, we can probably work it in at some point. Um, and so there's that. I feel like I'm forgetting something else. And I don't know what it is, so I'm going to just move on. <laughs> if I remember later, I'll tell you. How's that? There you go. All right. So last year, we spent the entire year, and each month I preached on one of the steps of recovery, right? Yep. Yeah. So each month corresponded, the step corresponded with the month. There's 12 months, there's 12 steps. It was good. I hope you enjoyed it. Now, I'm not giving up on the steps because we have to continually work the steps, 
Once we get to step 12, we start over again. Or wait, no. Actually, we just keep working the steps, don't we? We don't actually start over. We just learn how to implement them in greater ways. And so we'll talk about the steps as we continue to work this process out. But we wrapped up last year talking about the 12th step, saying having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps. And I reminded you that the reality of that statement is that we need to walk our life out in the spirit, right? And so we're going to be talking about life in the spirit for a while. There are so many things that we need to discuss. It, it can take us a long time to even scratch the surface when it comes to the spirit. A couple of weeks ago I told you all that many churches, they, they focus on God. Some churches focus on Jesus. Some churches focus on the Holy Spirit. There are some denominations that say it's only God and Jesus. And some denominations that say it's only Jesus and, and the Holy Spirit. And I'm here to tell you, I have learned a lesson. And that lesson is, you can't have power without all three. Amen. God the Father, Jesus our Savior, and the Holy Spirit, who teaches us everything and reminds us what Jesus said. Amen. All right? And we're going to talk about that um, coming up soon, about that, that whole specific thing. The point is we need to engage all three parts of God in every part of our life. And one of the things that we've been talking about for the last month is the fact that we need to see the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Correct? And, and I've driven the point home. Hopefully you've all heard me say it at least once. It is one fruit that has multiple segments, kind of like an orange, right? And so, let's take a look at those segments. Galatians 5, 22 through 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. The screen says forbearance, but that's patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And I've been reminding you for weeks now that what Paul is saying there is if you have these segments of the Spirit active in your life, even if it's for only a moment's period of time, if you've got every single one of them there, it's not possible for you to go against God. Right? Right? I could, I could definitely have kindness and goodness and faithfulness all in my life, all because I decided to put them there. Doesn't mean I'm pleasing God. Because there's a really good chance I am not exercising self-control. Right? That's just the way it works. If we have all of these together, then we can find that we will be under the command of God. Verse 24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have been crucified, the flesh has crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. It's interesting that the message version of the Bible, that version that many evangelicals don't like because it's too haphazard in the way it puts the words together, and I'll be honest, I'm not a fan. Uh, uh, it, it is not a good study version. It's a great read, though. I'm here to tell you, it's a great read. If you're wanting to read the Bible and let God do the work in you, you have to overcome your dislike and see what God has to say. So the message translation for those verses reads this way. But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. 
Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Legalism is helpless in bringing this about. It only gets in the way. Among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good. It's crucified. Since this kind of life we have chosen, since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts but works out its implications in every detail of our lives. That means we will not compare ourselves with each other as if one of us were better and another worse. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives. Each of us is an original. How powerful is that? Each of us is an original. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. <coughs> How many of you were here on Friday night? A couple of you. Okay. We watched a movie about um, <coughs> healing and ministering healing. And after the movie, we took some time and we discussed some of the gifts of the Spirit. And I'm going to tell you, this year, as we continue on, we're going to spend time as a church talking and working towards looking at those gifts. It's an exciting conversation to discuss the way the Spirit of God works in the world around us. And even more so, when we can see those powerful gifts activated in our own personal life. A church, a congregation like ours, is supposed to have all of the gifts of the Spirit present and operating. And I'm here to tell you, every single person in this room right now has at least one gift from God that has been prominent in their life <coughs> for years. A gift like empathy, for example, we talked about it a little bit on Friday night. Empathy doesn't it doesn't show up in the list of gifts, right? But it is a gift from the Spirit of God. Empathy is that that ability to look somebody in the eye and instantly know what they're feeling, what their emotional response is. You may not know the circumstance, but you know what they're feeling. And I told you Friday night that there's, there's a truth behind this. Most people that are born with the gift of empathy find by the time they're teenagers, they are hurting so bad because every, they feel everything all around them, but nobody bothered to tell them it's not their pain. Yeah, Joe? Is that sort of like being emotionally sensitive and thin-skinned? Sometimes. It, it, can, it can definitely <coughs> manifest that way. Yeah. <coughs> the gift of empathy is one of those things that drives many people to alcoholism or drug addiction because they don't know how to deal with all the pain and they assume it's theirs but because it's not theirs there's nothing they can do to make it go away right 
when somebody ha that has the gift of empathy realizes it and they realize the pain's not theirs, then the next thing, and by the way, have you ever noticed that when somebody like that is in your life, they tend to hurt everyone around them because they're hurting so bad because they're noticing all the pain and just amplifies things around them? Well, when someone like that learns that they have the gift and that the pain that they're experiencing isn't really theirs, the next thing that almost always happens if there's no training involved is they decide, well, since I know that they've got this pain, I need to fix it. Especially if it's a man who has this problem. Because the reality is I'm calling it a blessing, a gift from the Spirit. But most people that have it, think of it as a curse. <laughs> it's painful. But I'm here to tell you, when the majority of you, if you, you've experienced this even partially, the gift of empathy is probably one of the most important gifts out there, but it's not so you can fix things. James 5.16 says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for each other though that you may be healed. Right? Nobody's going to talk about the stuff that's hurting in their life unless they know somebody cares and understands. The person with the gift of empathy does. And in that situation, their job is, number one, to pray that the Holy Spirit will move in their life. And number two, to shut their mouth and listen. That's the most powerful thing a person with the gift of empathy can do. Now, don't get me wrong. There are times when a person with the gift of empathy also has other spiritual gifts, and they can employ those. But you see how this works out. These spiritual gifts are incredible. But sometimes we want to employ them without understanding. And we're going to work on this this year. We're going to start to learn these things. And so Friday night as we were going through this conversation, we talked about the gift of healing. And I told everyone that was here that healing is never a conditional response to the person that needs the healing's faith. And I've gotten argued with, and I get it, and I'm not going to change my mind because I know what the Word says. Jesus did commend those people that had faith. They received healing, and he said, you are healed by your faith. They had faith. And Jesus recognized it. But there were so many that came to Jesus and were healed that didn't have faith. It wasn't conditional on their faith. Jesus healed everyone that came to him for healing. And I want to point something out that's really important. While the person needing healing did not need the faith, they did need an unconditional desire to be healed. In John chapter 5, Jesus came across a man that had been desiring to be healed for years. He had come in to a city gate into Jerusalem. The pool of Bethesda. Yep, I think it was a sheep's gate. I don't have the, the Bible open to tell you exactly where it's at, uh, what, what gate it was, but uh, I think it was a sheep's gate. So John chapter 5, Jesus has walked into Jerusalem, and there's all these people here at this pool. Now, the custom, the tradition, the understanding was that this pool, the angels would come once in a while and stir the pool up, and the first person to get in the water while it was being stirred got healed. All right? That was the tradition. All right? And so Jesus comes into town, walks in through the sheep's gate, ends up at the pool of Bethesda. And we read in John, or 
John chapter 5, verses 3 through 9. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? <laughs> Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. The day on which this took place was the Sabbath. The only thing that was needed in that situation was an absolute desire. The problem in healing in general. When things don't happen, it often comes down to one of two areas. The first one we talked about on Friday night. It's the, the one praying or the one doing the ministering of healing actually lacks faith or they have fear or they're doing it for a selfish reason. It might be because they're trying to minister healing to someone and hoping that that will make them look good. It might be because they're too close to the situation and they, they want the healing for their own sake. Uh, it is true that those that have the gift of healing, the spiritual gift of healing, often struggle with ministering healing into their own family members because it is so personal to them that they're not doing it from a place of faith. Yeah, Joe. Isn't that true, though, of most, for instance, if we talk to our family members on recovery, it doesn't work. It's really a hornet's nest. And, and, and so you're absolutely right. And do you know why? We're too close to the situation. We're too close to the situation, number one. Number two, you're ministering healing. That is what recovery is. Right? When we try to minister healing from a place of selfishness, we can almost guarantee it will fail. But there's one more reason why healing fails. And it's probably a lot more common than the selfish or lack of faith reason from the one doing the ministry. And that's what we're going to talk about today. The one that needs the healing finds themselves either in the moment or later on not really wanting the healing at whatever cost. They're not willing to accept the price for deliverance. They want to control the terms and conditions of the healing. I've met, I don't know how many, that have wanted the relief from pain, but not the responsibility of the healing. So many times the healing is actually even given to them when they've asked for prayer, but the affliction presents itself again because the person finds they're missing something that that ailment, whether it's the addiction. I mean, how many of you have heard the, the fact that alcoholism is a disease, right? I don't dismiss that. Don't dismiss it at all. It's an affliction. 
And the reason it comes back is because we start missing something that that affliction had provided in our lives. Our friend. Our friend. But it's more than just that. Oftentimes physical healing is the same thing. They're missing something, so they gladly invite it back into their life. Sometimes they just outright reject healing in the first place. They don't want healing. They want relief from pain. Because they know if they're healed, it will take away something useful or comfortable in their life. While they know they should be free from it, they really don't want to be free. They just want the pain to be reduced. So many people find there's an emotional or financial or convenient outcome from an affliction that they will have to give up if they're healed. I'll give you an example. Someone, and it's in general, so if this sounds like you, I'm, I'm not thinking of you, okay? And I honestly, I hadn't planned on going here, but I think it's important that I bring it up. Someone who is on disability because they have a back problem or they have MS or I don't care what affliction, and it's providing an income for them, right? They're in tremendous pain. Their life is miserable. It's difficult to live. They want the relief. But they're more afraid of not having the income than they are worried about the pain. They want the pain to be reduced, but they've got to keep the disability. And I've watched it happen. It breaks my heart. That's just one example, an extreme example. I've also seen people, literally seen people, who knew that if they got well, they were going to lose everything. They are going to have to start all over again. As soon as the doctor recognized that they were coming back around and they were past the 50% mark and they could start being useful in society, the doctor was going to report it to Social Security and they were going to lose their disability. I know an individual that actually happened to, right? Turned their world upside down for a while. So much better today than it ever was on disability. But it turned the world upside down. And had they been afraid of that, this person I know would have died. Because their ailment, literally, the doctor had said to them, we're just waiting for your heart to stop. You will die. It's interesting that we often think that we have to, we can get relief from our pain, but we can keep all the, the side benefits. But, you know, Jesus reminded the man that was healed after 38 years of affliction. That the healing had a responsibility that went with it. The NIV reads, Later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, See, you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. Now, I want to explain something to you. This man that Jesus healed... As soon as he told him to get up, pick up your mat, and walk, Jesus slipped away into the crowd. It was a Sabbath day, and the Pharisees saw the man carrying his mat. And they said, what do you think you're doing? It's the Sabbath. You're not allowed to work on the Sabbath. You're carrying that mat. That's a sin. It's against the law. You can't do that. And the guy said, um, the man that healed me told me to pick up the mat and walk. What should I have done? And they said, who healed you? What was his response? I don't know. Because Jesus didn't stick around and he never asked. 
He didn't have faith in Jesus. He didn't know who he was. And yet he was healed. But later Jesus finds him and says, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse befalls you. That's the Revised Standard Version. This man had been accused by the Pharisees of breaking the law by carrying his mat on a Sabbath. And when he was questioned, he told them, I don't know who healed me. Because Jesus had slipped away. Jesus tells him, don't sin anymore. Start living your life right. Become useful in society. Take care of yourself. Stop living in your parents' house. I don't know what he said. But, but you get the idea. It wasn't just stop sinning. That wasn't what he said. I guarantee it. He looked at the guy and said, this is how you've lived your life. You've been relying on everybody else your entire life. I told you to pick up your mat and walk. Now go take care of yourself and stop being a burden to everybody else. Because that's your responsibility. And what was the man's response? The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us what happened to this man or why he went to the Jewish leaders. And in my mind, there's only two options why. First, Jesus said, don't sin anymore. And since the Jewish leaders had asked him who healed him, he went to the, Jew the leaders and said, you asked me who it was, and so uh, now I know it was Jesus. <clears throat> you know, he just needed to answer their questions. That's a possibility. It is. Or he got a ticket. Oh, well, maybe he got a ticket. Yep. He had to go tell him who it was so he could get out of his fine. Repair and report, right? It's possible, couldn't it? it? It's possible. Absolutely possible. The Pharisees were real stickers on legal stuff, weren't they? Absolutely. But here's the thing. If I was the man that was healed, especially before I turned my life over to Jesus Christ and started living as if he was my Lord. I would have turned Jesus in because I, he had offended me and told me that I needed to start taking care of myself. How dare he tell me what I have to do? He can't tell me anything. Who does he think he is? I'll fix him. Uh, maybe I'm the only one. I'm kind of looking around the room thinking most of you would probably react the same way. <laughs> Even though Jesus was the one that gave him his freedom, he went back and said, I'll, I'll show you. I like my life the way it is. All these people taking care of me. It's been 38 years. I don't know how to do anything but beg. And now you're telling me i got to get out there and get a job? Mom's basement is really comfortable. I'm staying there. That's exactly how I would have felt. The reality is most of us don't think about the responsibility that comes with healing. Whether it be physical, emotional, spiritual, mental, addictive behavior, I don't care what kind of healing it is. It comes with responsibility. 
And it's why I'm spending so much time not only pointing out the steps of recovery that take us to the point where we can see the fruit of the Spirit in our life, but also why I'm going to spend so much time discussing the important pieces of the fruit in our life. Let's think about the idea of self-control for a minute. It's one of those things that most of us think we can comprehend. Self-control. But what is it? I know every one of you has got an answer. What's self-control? <laughs> Not eating. <laughs> Not eating, okay. The ability to restrain your passions and desires. The ability to restrain your passions and desires. That's a good answer. Amen. Yep. Boring. Boring. <laughs> we often think about willpower and self-control as the same thing, don't we? Something that we have within us. But the truth is, both of those things really rely on something outside of ourselves. Now, I can't talk for any of you, but I can tell you my experience and the things that I've learned. And hopefully I've learned some, some decent lessons or I shouldn't be standing here. You know, I learned that, number one, I have absolutely no control to do anything good. Isn't that step one? The second thing I've learned is my will, my personal will, is always dark, depraved. But step three says that we learn that we can turn our life and our will over to the care of God. And by the time we get to step 12, we're ready to live under the control of self that only comes from the Spirit of God. You know, Paul tells us some of the things that are the opposite of the Spirit or the opposite of having God in control of our lives. And I'm going to read it for you again out of the message translation because sometimes it's good to hear these things in ways that we've never heard it before. Galatians 5, 16 through 21. My counsel is this. Live freely animated and motivated by God's Spirit. Then you won't feed the compulsions of selfishness. For there is a root of sinful self-interest in us that is at odds with the free spirit. Just as a free, the free spirit is un incompatible with selfishness, these two ways of life are contrary to each other. So that you cannot live at times one way and at times another way according to how you feel on any given day. Why don't you choose to be led by the Spirit and so escape the errat erratic compulsions of the law-dominated existence? It's obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive loveless, cheap sex, and stinking accumulation of me mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, and impotence to love, or to be loved. Divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of co community. I could go on. 
This isn't the first time I've warned you. You know, if you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Willpower and self-control are only God's power in action. God's power in action in my life. Not one of us really have them. They can only be put into action in our life when we're willing to give God anything. Wait, that means give up everything. Mm -hmm. To find the freedom of the kingdom right here, right now, in this life, we have to be willing to do that. You know, Jesus told his disciples that for anyone to have the kingdom life, they had to take up their cross and follow him. Matthew 16, 24 through 28. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they've done. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Again, let me read it for you out of the message translation. Then Jesus went to work on his disciples. Anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. You're not in the driver's seat. I am. Don't run from suffering. Embrace it. Follow me and I'll show you how. Self-help is no help at all. Self-sacrifice is the way, my way, to find yourself, your true self. What kind of deal is it to get everything you want but lose yourself? What could you ever trade your soul for? Some of us have done it for alcohol, drugs, sex. We don't have to live there anymore. Don't be in such a hurry to go home into business. Go into business for yourself. Before you know it, the Son of Man will arrive with all the splendor of his Father, accompanied by an army of angels. You'll get everything you have coming to you. A personal gift. This isn't pie in the sky, by and by. Some of you standing here are going to see it take place. See the Son of Man in His kingdom glory. Verse 28 out of the NIV again. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom. And oftentimes people think that they're only that's only referring to the disciples that saw Jesus on the mountain when he talked in his glory and God said, This is my son, obey him. That's not but, but let me tell you, Jesus' entire message, the entire time, the good news has always been one thing. And we often miss it. The kingdom life is for you now. He says, some of you standing here, sitting here right now, have the opportunity, or will have the opportunity, to see the Son of Man in his kingdom. It's true. Self-control 
It really comes down to being willing to take the responsibility to do whatever it takes to receive and keep the healing at whatever cost. Our struggle comes down to the fact that we often aren't willing to recognize or live within the responsibility that comes with that. Yes, sir. Does salvation come under the category of healing? <laughs> That's a great question. So in the Bible, when you read, um, especially in the New Testament, and you read that there was a place where the disciples shared the gospel message with a man, and he accepted it, and he was saved and his entire family. Right? You know that word saved right there not only means salvation for eternity, but it also means healed. We take up our cross and follow him, no matter the cost. <laughs> Now, I'm here to tell you this isn't something that's easy to do. I'm not completely there. Wait, I am not even close to being there. My job isn't to be arrived. My only job is to be at least a step ahead of you. That's, that's my job. And so I get to learn these lessons right along with you. But I know this, healing, whether it comes from the need from addiction, from the physical ailment, from emotional pain, from lack of self-control, whatever the, the, the thing is, it's there for you. And it's available to you. You don't need anybody to minister to it, to you and give it to you, although it, it can be done that way. Because you can have faith, and your faith can heal you. But, you have to want the healing at whatever the cost. When I was going through my cancer treatments, I knew the Lord. I'd been ministering for a while. Matter of fact, at that point in my life, I, had, I was praying over people while I was sick and watching God heal them, but I wasn't getting any better. I was crying out to God one day. And he said, are you willing to die? And I said, I shouldn't have to. I wasn't getting any better. Things changed in my life when I realized that if that was his will and his need, as long as somebody found him through my death, I was okay with that. I'm willing to give up everything if that's what you need me to do. It wasn't very long after that that I was healed. I know the day I was healed. I felt it happen. I continued to go through my chemo and radiation treatments. And I wanted to quit because I knew I was healed. But God said, keep going. I, okay. You know why I said, okay? Because I was willing to take on the responsibility of my healing. Today I understand what it means to go through 39 consecutive radiation treatments <clears throat> along with 8 or 9 chemo treatments. 9 chemo treatments all at the same time. Some of us in this room also understand that pain. It's miserable. I don't wish it on anybody. Yes, Joe? 
You talked about responsibility and training the addiction and the disability for responsibility and to take, take uh, to get your mat and walk. Do you find that once you start to get into the recovery process and grasp it, I don't mean the first month or something, I mean to start to go down the road and start towards the steps. You're not going to look in your back anymore on a daily basis. Do you find that it starts to get a little easier and that even though you're taking on different things and you've suffered some physical problems, you have more of a focus on God's will and that it's easier to progress on that path. And the answer is yes, but we often compartmentalize our life. And so we find it really easy to put our focus on God in one area and leave him completely out in other areas. Um, and so the answer is yes, the more we practice it, the easier it is. But there are some areas, of every one of us in this room, myself included, that we say, I love you, God, and I trust you in everything except this. No, it's, it's just a fact. And so I, even I, need to say, I love you, God, and I trust you in everything, and I will take on whatever consequence that means. Now, I will tell you, there's lots of times I say, I'll do that, God, but I don't like it. <laughs> okay? And he says, good, I don't expect you to like it. <laughs> and there are still areas that he keeps pointing out to me that where he says, Jay, you said you trusted me in every area of your life, but right here, do you really trust me? Because I might ask you to take and lose that thing. Are you going to be okay with that? And when I'm honest with myself, often I say no. But I want to be. Or no, and I'm not ready to be. And those are real answers, right? And then I can pray, but help me to be ready to be. Not help me do it. Help me to be ready to do it. Because <laughs> my first step, I, maybe I'm way off base and this isn't work. But my first step in anything that God wants me to do is not to say, help me do it, God. No, my first step is, help me to want to do it, God. And once I get the want to, then I can say, okay, now what do I have to do? And then it often goes from, oh, you have to do this? Okay, help me want to do that. <laughs> because I'm really thick-headed and really stubborn. How about you? The reality is, and we've gone through this. And we've talked about it. We have to be willing to accept <laughs> healing at whatever the cost. Not a single person comes into recovery for alcoholism. And I'm not going to talk about drugs because that wasn't my area of struggle. And I'm going to say this as a blanket statement. And if I'm wrong, you can come talk to me about it later and we can have this conversation, okay? Uh, I'm willing to be wrong in this, but um, I don't think I am. Not a single one of us finds that we need to work out our recovery until the pain is so deep that we're finally willing to do and lose everything to be free from that demon. To be healed from that demon. I don't think I'm wrong. You can't get sobriety without it. And the reality is, you can have a period of time with sobriety, but you can't have, you, you can do it in multiples of different ways. But I, let me tell you something. If you're working your recovery from step one to step 12, and you've really worked out step three in your life, that's when you find that you're working your recovery. And if you find recovery working in your life, 
You don't have to chase the ride anymore. It just happens. Because, as we said at the very beginning, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And as we work out the process of recovery, we gain those in our lives. And we gain those because we've invited the Spirit of God into our life. And against those things, there is no law. Nothing can hold us back from doing what God wants when we experience that. So my question to you today is are you willing, are you willing to let the Holy Spirit exercise that self-control in your life? I'm going to play Holy Spirit by Francesca Valestelli again. I want us to truly hear this. Sing this, even if it's in your head, and invite the Spirit of God into your life. Because it will change everything. And as you find the Spirit of God present, you'll become more willing to give up anything to have the healing He wants for you. If anyone needs prayer, please feel free to come up while the song plays.